Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on? A critique, a moral critique of America in times like these. What's going on? An old song first sung by Marvin Gaye in another season. I must tell you, on election night in 2016, I felt a great sadness for America, but it wasn't a democratic sadness. It wasn't a Republican sadness, but a sadness for the heart, the soul, and the moral health of the nation. It is impossible, I believe, to react to the election of Donald Trump with anything less than moral outrage. Trump is, as David Remnick wrote it for the New Yorker, vulgarity unbounded. <clears throat> and his election has not only struck fear in the hearts of the vulnerable, but also given rise to hundreds of documented cases of harassment and intimidation. He ran his campaign sensing the feeling of dispossession and anxiety among millions of voters, white voters in the main, and many of those voters, not all, but many followed him because he was willing to trumpet their fury and affirm their sense deeply rooted in this nation's history of race and class that a new world was conspiring against their interests. Now, he offered no answers to their fears. He merely said, you are right to be afraid and very afraid. Obama is the boogeyman of a coming diversity that will undo the world you grew up knowing. And I and I alone can fix it. When I heard those words, I did not have a democratic sadness or a Republican sadness. It had nothing to do with that. But for any person or man to stand up or woman and say, I and I alone can fix it, can cure your fears, is a deep moral question. Nell Painter of Princeton University said that this election was the iconography of a too often repeated American experience. We take some steps forward when it comes to justice, and then we take steps that are backwards, that are often vicious, hurtful, and mean. So what saddened me, Mr. President, is not that Democrats didn't win, because I'm an independent, registered independent, and I serve a God who's neither Democrat nor Republican. What saddens me is not that Hillary didn't win, and not even that Trump won, but what saddened me were the immoral factors that decided the election and said something about America and, and uncovered, did not create, we're already there, uncovered realities and fights that my mama and daddy were fighting when I was born 55 years ago. Our deepest constitutional values say that when we elect any leader or congressperson of this country, they put their hand on the Bible and they swear to do some basic things. It says, first of all, they swear to care about we the people, not I themselves. And then they swear to admit that this nation every now and then has to go to confession because they say in order to obtain a more perfect union, which is to confess that where we are at any moment in history is not perfection that there is not some greatness again behind us. There is always the pursuit of a more perfect nation. And then they swear that they, every policy they pass, everything they do will be to establish justice, to provide for the common, excuse me, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense and to promote the general welfare. Yes, welfare is a constitutional word. It is not a word we should run from or one we should hide from or one we should set as those, those radical people. It is in the constitution of one of the four pillars 
that must be hold up this democracy if we are to have a democracy that is even worthy of being passed on to our future posterity. And then in our deepest religious, Judeo-Christian, Muslim, even Sikh traditions, all of the major religions, there are some basic fundamental values, moral, moral values, love, truth, that the poor and the stranger and the least of these and those who are sick are supposed to be the for, at the forefront of a nation's attention if that nation is trying to live out a moral vision. And what made me sad and scared me for this nation was that we had 26 presidential debates in the primary and in the general election in 2016 and not one on the Republican side or the Democratic side, not one hour was on racism. The ultimate stigma, uh, ultimate stamp position against the Imago Dei. Not one hour was on poverty. Not one hour was on ecological devastation or the war economy. Instead, we had a whole election about tweets and who grabs what, when, and where, and which woman did this, and which woman didn't do that, and what man did that. And if our moral narrative is that shallow, we should not be surprised that we have shallowness holding office. And then we had an election where three million people voted for one candidate more than the other, but an outdated electoral college rooted in the racism of slavery controlled who was selected. But while I was sad, my brothers and sisters, I also knew that this season, this Trumpism, is as American as apple pie that America has always had great difficulty with living up to who she says she is on paper. Dr. King once said, America has had a high blood pressure of creeds, but an anemia of deeds. And I stop to tell you to examine what's wrong with America today. You must know what has been wrong with America yesterday. Because my friends, what you see now is not new, nor is it the worst thing we've ever seen. Hmm. There could be no Trumpism without America's first black president. And I didn't agree totally with that president either. But Van Jones got it right when he said we experienced a kind of a white lash. And he said, as Nell Painter has said, you have to understand that in U.S. history, every stride toward more inclusion, whether it's the inclusion of gay people or the inclusion of immigrants or the inclusion of black people or the inclusion of native people, is always met and has been met with some backlash. The main lesson history offers us in our present moral Christ is, is this. The white nationalism and the nationalistic tendencies that we see now are not new. Let me see if we can go to class. Can we go to class? In America, we've had at least two reconstructions. The first reconstruction happened in the shadow of slavery and amid the wreckage of the Civil War, 1965, after the Civil War, African Americans joined hands with whites in the North and poor whites in the South, black and poor white folk in the South got together who were willing to see one another as allies and who understood that America needed to move in a moral direction away from the vestiges of slavery. And so white and black people created fusion alliances. And by 1868, they controlled every state house in the South. 
And what did they commit to? They committed to overcome the immoral legacy of chattel slavery together. Together, white and black folk, 1868, 1869, 1970, 1870, 1871, they elected new leaders. Almost all of the Southern legislators were controlled by either a predominantly black alliance or a strong interracial fusion coalition. They hammered out new constitutions that clearly denounced and made slavery unconstitutional. For instance, in my state, North Carolina, listen at the Constitution, the morality in the Constitution that was written when black and whites were together, working together after the Civil War. They put this in the, in the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal in endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. 1868, black and white people working together in the South, they guarantee public education. Article 6 of that same constitution says that beneficent provision for the poor and the unfortunate and the orphan is the first duty of a civilized and Christian state. That's a constitution written by black, former black slaves and white people coming together in the South who were poor, who said, what, what must our constitutions look like if we're going to have a moral vision? These same coalitions 150 years ago built the first public schools and they built the first state constitutions that gave persons a constitutional right to public education. We don't even have that in the federal constitution today. But when black and white people found themselves coming together for a new nation after the Civil War, poor white, poo, fig, white people figured out that they had been fooled by the white bourbon slave master class. And that poor whites were in the same position as former black former slaves. And they came together and formed power. They, they included labor rights. They fought for health care. They raised taxes to make sure that the government that had created slavery could now pay for fixing what they had created. They expanded access to the ballot. They established fairness in the criminal justice system. But in four years, the experiment of the first Reconstruction faced powerful and immoral opposition. And we must understand that opposition then in order to understand what we're seeing now and why it's not new. They decided, they called themselves the redemption movement. But the redemption movement's theme was We've got to make America great again. 1872, the Klan was formed, not to go after black people, but to go after white people who dared to work with black people. And what did this redemption movement do? They wanted to take back America. They, 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 they cut taxes so that you couldn't fund the Freedmen Bureau hospitals that were giving health care to poor white people and poor black people. They went after education. They went after the court system and then began to try to stack the courts. But in order to do that, they had to put in new voter suppression laws. 1872, 1873, 1874, 75. All of these things lined up. They began to attack leaders of progressivism with threats and attacks on their homes and their bodies. What we are seeing is not new. Oh, and by 1877, there was an election in America and the candidate that won the election, was selected for president, lost the popular vote. Cut a deal to get the Electoral College, but the promise was, if you give me the presidency, I'll give you the Supreme Court. You give me the presidency, I'll cut taxes. If you give me the presidency, I'll split the nation, I'll pull the troops out of the South, I will allow the radical extremist elements of white nationalism to take over the South. That was the deal called the Rutherford B. Hayes Compromise, 1877. In 1875, the United States Congress had passed a Civil Rights Act that made it a felony to discriminate 
1877, Rutherford B. Hayes gets elected. He pushes two Supreme Court justices onto the court. By 1883 to 1875, Civil Rights Act was voted against. Only one justice, Justice Harlan from, 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 um, from uh, Kentucky, Harlan, dissented. By 1896, you had Plessy versus Ferguson that declared separate but equal was the law of the land. And by 1901, every African-American member of the United States House of Representatives had been gerrymandered out of office. It was a moral crisis. Then in around the turn of the century, you have the progressive era in the 1900s. And this time, it wasn't a Republican named Rutherford B. Hayes, but a Democrat named Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, he was the president of Princeton. He was a governor, but he was a racist. And he ran, and he was elected, and he ascended to the White House. White populists had gotten behind the white supremacy campaign of the then Democratic Party, different than the party now, but then Democratic Party. And the white-only Democrats of the South pushed Woodrow Wilson into office. They were glad he was in the office. And the first thing he did was he resegregated the federal offices in D.C. One of the second things he did a hundred years before Steve Bannon and his white supremacists was, was in the White House, President Wilson invited his college buddy, Reverend Thomas Dixon, who was the writer of a book called The Klansman that became the, a film, the first sound film ever viewed in the Oval Office. It was called The Birth of a Nation and The Birth of a Nation when it debuted, the whole point of it was that the fusionists, the black and white people that had worked together in the 1800s, had caused the nation to go down, and it was time once again to take America back and make it great again. And by 1919, a statue was put up. They said it was to honor Robert E. Lee at, in Charlottesville, Virginia, but actually it was put up to pay homage to Woodrow Wilson because Woodrow Wilson represented white supremacy. And that's the statue that the alt-right group marched around a couple, four, few years ago. That statue was not put up to honor the Civil War. Most of the statues to the Confederacy were not put up to honor the Civil War. Most of them were put up between 1896 and 1920, after Plessy versus Ferguson, to pay homage to the immoral return of white supremacy in our public policy. Whew. This is not new. 1954, we have the second Reconstruction, Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall leads a group of white and Jewish and black lawyers into the Supreme Court, nine white justices, one of them a former Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard. Justice Charles Warren, Justice Warren, excuse me, who had been wrong on the Chinese question in California, had been wrong, and everybody thought surely he would not vote to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. But the arguments of Thurgood Marshall and Brown and others were so strong that the Warren court unanimously overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and started the second reconstruction of America. One year later, oh, by the way, the first riots uh, 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 against the Brown decision happened up here in New York, not in the South. One year later, Emmett Till gets killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi. I was just a few miles from there just yesterday. Killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi in reaction to the Brown decision. Rosa Parks sees his death and watches his killers get acquitted, and she does not burn her own community down. She decides to take a moral act to sit down on a bus that her people might stand up. And Martin Luther King was there as a new preacher, and here on her back, on her sitting down, he stood up, and the Montgomery bus boycott movement started, and the second Reconstruction began. The March on Washington in 63. I'm passing over a lot of history. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but between 55 and 65, there's a lot of blood, a lot of death. In fact, in 1963, right after the, the beginning of 1963, February, George Wallace stands up and gives an inauguration speech where he talks about how the country is being taken over and we need to take it back. And he says segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's a governor, but he has a loud mouth. And as a high elected official, he begins to spew violent rhetoric. And by the end of 63, Mega Evers is dead. Four girls in a Birmingham church are blown up and a president is dead. But it all starts with mouth. The year I was born. Now, as this was going on, as America was beginning to move in new direction, and as people were coming together, the civil rights movement was black, it was white, it was young, it was old, it was gay, it was straight, it was Catholic, it was Jewish, it was Muslim. All of this was happening, and the country was going through a second reconstruction. Extremists couldn't handle it. So the transformative power of moral fusion once again came under attack like it came under attack in the 1800s. It was defined by a guy by the name of Kevin Phillips. He was a Republican strategist to Nixon. He came up with something called the White Southern Strategy. It was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way that would drive whites uh, uh, to vote uh, against anybody that helped African Americans, even if it hurt them. It was a policy that was designed to get whites to leave the ranks of the Democratic Party in the South to guarantee that never again would a John Kennedy or Lyndon Baines Johnson be elected again. It was called the Southern Strategy. Tim Wise, who's a scholar, notes that this strategy was not new. It had been around, but what began to happen in the 60s is all the programs that started in the 30s that helped many, many whites to develop their economic proudness, Social Security, uh, then later on Medicaid in the, in the, in the 60s and 50s, and, and all of the social programs were suddenly racialized as soon as African Americans and brown people begin to have access to it. Because you do know that 1935 was Social Security, but in order for Franklin Delano Roosevelt to pass Social Security, he had to cut a deal with white Southern senators that said, we won't vote for it if you allow people in the agrarian culture, that is um, sharecroppers, and in the domestic culture, that's maids and other, to pay into Social Security, which meant most black people couldn't pay in in 1935, and 50% of white women couldn't pay in, and they did not get the right to pay in until 1954. We've always had a moral struggle in America. In fact, I, I know I'm in this church, but Lee Atwater actually described how this program worked. He says, in 1954, if you want to win, you start out by saying nigga, nigga, nigga. But by 1968, you can't say nigga. That hurts you. It backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing and states' rights and all that stuff. And then you talk about cutting taxes. And all the things you're talking about seem to be totally economic. But the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites, and whites blame blacks for their problem when, in fact, poor whites and low-income whites need to be partners with poor-income blacks, white and black and brown together. What was the language of the deconstruction of white Southern strategy? Entitlement programs are bad because all those lazy brown people and black people are getting stuff. We must cut taxes because the welfare programs are breaking the country, not the unnecessary wars we've gone into. Oh, the other language? Those protesters out there are mobs. They're mobs. They're mobs. That's direct quotes from segregationists in the 1960s when political leaders declared that people protesting for justice and right were mobs. Have you heard that lately? On June 11, 1963, George Wallace stood in the door of the University of Alabama. He pretended to defy the desegregation order against Assistant Attorney General uh, Nicholas Koschenbach. Within a week of Wallace's performance, he received 100,000 congratulatory telegrams, and 95% of his mail came from above the Mason-Dixon line. 
and it was his fan mail that he received for standing in the door trying to block desegregation that caused him to say, I'm going to run for president. And he ran in 64 for president as a racist. He got 30% of the votes in the Indiana primary, and all he had was two Ku Klux Klanmen running his campaign out of a service station phone book. He won 43% Roz, of the Maryland Democratic primary in 1964. George Wallace, a, a racist, won 43% of Maryland's primary, 16 of the 23 state counties. And George Wallace said if it hadn't been for the end vote, we would have won the whole thing. His, his election was such a surprising performance that George H.W. Bush decided for the first time to run for Congress, and when he ran, his theme was that the 14th Amendment and the new civil rights laws were a burden on the majority of people. This stuff is not new. What's going on? When President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he told his staff, I think we just gave the South to the Republicans for your lifetime and mine. Strom Thurmond, who, who filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1957 for 24 hours, he campaigned and joined Nixon's Southern strategy. In fact, he was the one that helped make the, the, the name famous. Wallace, excuse me, Nixon, would then run. He used his friendship with Billy Graham to appeal to white Southerners, inviting the evangelists to counsel him about whether or not to run for the presidents, though he had already made his decision. He claimed that Graham was the most important reason for him running in 68. He used the Southern strategy. He chose Agnew, governor of the border state of Maryland, primarily because of Agnew's diatribe against mainstream black leaders in Baltimore after the riots in the 1968 wake of King's assassination. Agnew became Nixon's Wallace, using acerbic attacks to say things Nixon could not quite say to make visceral racial appeals to create what the Nixon strategists call positive polarization. What you're seeing now is, is a plan. And it's not new, positive polarization. The real architect of this was Kevin Phillips, whose book, The Emerging Republican Majority, was published after the election, but in manuscript had become virtually the Bible of Nixon's 1978 campaign. Phillips called America the melting pot that never melted and explained, listen to what he told Nixon and think about today. He said to Nixon, all you've got to do with American politics is work out who hates who and play them against each other. Phillips advised Nixon that the Republican Party could win without Negro votes by painting the Democrats as a black party and as radical and as mobs. Phillips predicted a new American revolution coming out of the South and the West because of the fears and objections raised by the civil rights movement's victory. And he noted that white ethnics in the North were also right for the picking, correctly predicting, for example, that some in De De Irish Democrats in New York would turn because they didn't like the Jews and the Negroes and they played all of that stuff. This is footnoted. I'm not just running off at the mouth. This is things they said. The South, Phillips said, would become the new base for the Republican Party, and Harry Dent urged Nixon to use racially coded language strong enough to divide people and to use that language in campaign rallies to create this positive polar resistance. Nixon wins. He wins in a narrow victory in 1968. He would have won by a landslide, but George Wallace siphoned off 13% of the vote. Nixon decided by the next election he wanted to win everything. And Kevin Phillips was optimistic. He said white Southerners would ease their way into the Republican Party by way of American independence. And Phillips assured Nixon, if you keep playing folk against one another and finding out who hates who and blame each side rather than fix the problems, you can win. Almost immediately when Nixon was elected, the first thing he did was began to nominate Supreme Court justices. And what did he nominate? He nominated Supreme Court justices that were against Brown. 
His Justice Department gave stays to Mississippi and said they didn't have to desegregate. His first nomination for the Supreme Court was Clement Hainsworth of South Carolina, a heavy segregationist. That's who he nominated for the Supreme Court. Now, it was blocked, then he nominated another one, but each time he was, they were blocked, his numbers went up in the polls, saying that we can count on him to appoint people to the Supreme Court basically that will take us backwards rather than forward. And so Lee Atwater ended up saying about the Southern strategy, it was my blueprint for everything I've done. So what you have to understand is that Donald, that what we saw with Trumpism in, the, in 2016 is not new. The struggle of America is as old as the first reconstruction, as old as the second reconstruction, and in fact, this, cry, this anger we are seeing now is a mo mo mode of feeling and a group of people that have been cultivated for the last 50 years. It's been by design. And so the question now is the fundamental question that America democracy faced in 1868, in 1915, in 1954 to 1960s, are the same questions we have to deal with now. Do we have a government that represents all Americans? Can we reconstruct a system founded on white supremacy and plantation capitalism? Is it possible to live up to our promise of liberty and justice for all? In 2018, we face the same fundamental question. The fierce urgency of now is not so much about Donald Trump. The world has endured narcissistic fear mongers before, and more to the point, we cannot afford to wait till the next election because the forces that brought this power into being threatened to literally upend the very notion of a democracy. And we're already seeing that some of our public leadership has demonstrated they have no capacity to fully name and resist these disastrous forces. Oh, they might call out some tweets every now and then, but then when the bills are passed, they're right there signing off. Muslim ban, Supreme Court nominee. And think about that, so what we saw in the Supreme Court. A lot of people got involved after we heard about Mrs. Ford and as horrific and ugly as that was, I know something about it because twice in my life there was attempted sexual abuse against me and I have no clue what it's like for a woman. But we better own something. The system was raped before we heard about Miss Ford. Because rape is not just about sexuality, it's about power. And when you hold up a seat for 400 days and we're not allowed, that's a form of abuse, of power. When you do not allow certain documents to come out, that's abuse of power. They knew before Miss Ford was ever brought her case and the other sisters. Sisters, they already knew it was on his record that he was for torture, Kavanaugh, that he was against abortion and had forced a woman to have a baby while she was incarcerated, that he was against, uh, he was for voter suppression, and he was for corporations over working people. All of that was known when he was nominated. The first person the White House called when Kavanaugh was nominated was not people about uh, 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 um, those issues. It was about corporation that over 90 percent of the times he voted on the side of corporations over against the people, which always hurts the poor and the working poor. Which is why, my friend, what we face now is not simply a political problem. It's not a left problem. It's not a right problem. It's not a conservative versus a liberal problem. That language is too puny. It's a heart problem. It's a moral malady. And what we're seeing now with the Trumpism and the rallies and the bomb are symptoms. The very heart and soul of our democracy is at stake once again. And if we are to understand this current crisis of citizenship in America, we must pay attention to five diseases that we're going to have to address if we are serious about America being a more perfect union. The first disease we must address is the issue of systemic racism. 
If we're going to uphold the great and universal moral principles of religion for every nation, love and justice, if we're going to truly believe that equal protection under the law is non-negotiable, we have to have a grown-up addressing of systemic racism. And by racism, I do not mean Roseanne Barr saying something foolish, and I do not mean somebody calling you the N-word. Systemic racism, voter suppression, immigrant injustice, resegregation of our public schools, and the new Jim Crow. Those did that the disease of systemic racism is a moral issue. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. It's about right versus wrong. Right now in America, we have less voting rights today than we had in 1965. That should cause us to tremble. The voting laws that are being passed, the voter suppression that is happening is hurting women, it's hurting black people, it's hurting brown people, it's hurting young people. There were 868 fewer voting sites in the black, brown, and poor white community that, uh, in 2016 than there were in 2012. 26 states have passed voter suppression laws and racial gerrymandering. That represents over 50 percent of the United States House of Representatives, over 44 senators where the people are winning elections, not because of fairness, but because of racialized voter suppression and gerrymandering. The Voting Rights Act that was passed August 6, 1965, and it was gutted by the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, June 23, 2015, with a five to four vote, could have been fixed on June 24. But the Congress has refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for five years. Now, Strom Thurmond filibustered the 57 Civil Rights Act for 24 hours. The current leadership of the Congress has refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for five years. Five years. We call Strom Thurmond a racist for what he did for 24 hours. But for five years, we don't have a voting rights act. We don't have section five. We don't have preclearance. States can pass laws. Those laws can go into effect. They can be found to be illegal and unconstitutional and racist five, ten years later. But all of the people that got elected with those laws get, get to stay elected and get to pass bills, which means we have a whole lot of state legislators and people in Congress who are unconstitutionally constituted. That's racism. Secondly, we must address systemic poverty. The richest nation in the history of the world and 43.5% of everybody in this country is poor, low wealth. Not 4.3%, 43.5%, of all our women and children are poor. Over 4, 15 million children are poor poor. And Robert, Robert Wright says, the ranks of the poor are growing because wages at the bottom have dropped, adjusted for inflation with increasing numbers of a Americans taking low-wage jobs in retail sales, restaurants, hotels, hospital, child care, elder care, and other services. That is how you can have, yes, unemployment going down, but wages going down. That's like getting in the car, cranking it up, and driving off a cliff. If the federal win minimum wage had kept pace with inflation, it would be $20 an hour today. Minimum wage is $7.25. There's not one county in America where you can afford a two-bedroom basic apartment working every day of the week. In some counties, you have to work 82 hours a week at $7.25 just to have meat a couple of times a week. Half of the work of African American workers in America make less than $15 an hour. 50% of all workers in the South, black and white, make less than $15 an hour. One 400 taxpayers in America make an average of $97,000 an hour, and we lock people up who march for 15 in a union. We have 140 million poor people in this country today, not 37 million, 147 million. And the top 1% of income earners in America today make 198 times more than the bottom 90%. And we had 26 presidential debates on both sides of the aisle and not one hour with any solution about poverty. We have to address ecological devastation and health care as a moral issue. 
Between 1970 and 1979, meteorologists recorded 660 disasters around the world. Between 2000 and 2009, the last decade on record, there were 3,322. Climate change is being seen in the hurricanes and their ferocity and how erratic they are. There are four million families in this country that make less excuse me, they can get up every morning and buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. There are 37 million people without health care, even with the Affordable Care Act. Senators and House members who get free health care off of our tax dollars are now trying to take health care away from the very people that elected them, even though they get free health care. Think about the morality of that. To get something you do not even want your constituency to have. And for every half million people that do not have health care, nearly 4,000 die. Which means every day somebody's dying, not because God called them home to their rest, but because of some government policy that denied them health care. There are 25 nations in this world that are the richest nation. We're the only one of the richest nations that do not offer some form of universal health care. We must address these moral issues. And finally, we have to address what I call religious nationalism. This kind of teaching that says all you got to do to be on God's side is be for prayer in the school, be for tax cuts, and be against women's rights, and be for gun rights. And that's what God cares about. When clearly the Bible says in Isaiah 10, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And surely Jesus said every nation, not person, every nation would be judged by how it treats the poor, the stranger, and the least of these, the hungry and the sick. And then we have to address the war economy. The 217 military budget is almost $600 billion, which doesn't even include veterans affairs, the nuclear arsenal. We can blow the world up, some say 50 times, seems like, some say 100 times, seems like twice is about enough. Whatever you didn't get the first time, you come back and get that. We spend now nearly 60 cents of every discretionary dollar goes to the military and less than 15 cents of every discretionary dollar to health care and education and jobs and infrastructure. If we just took $1 billion of our bloated military budget, just $1 billion, it would not hurt our, secure, military, our national security, $1 billion, we could pay for 12,000 elementary school teachers, 17,000 infrastructure jobs, 112,000 Head Start slots for children, and 96 veterans would receive comprehensive medical care. Imagine what we could do with $30 billion. Why don't we do it? We're in a moral crisis. And until we address these five moral issues, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, and health, the war economy and religious nationalism, we continually set up a narrative that will give us what we have seen today and what we saw in 1800s and what we saw in the 1960s. And so my brothers and sisters, I believe what's wrong with America is we need a moral analysis that doesn't simply follow the talking points of our time, but digs deeper into our national psyche. We need spaces like this to tell the truth about our history. We need a moral movement to revive the heart of our democracy. And we must first own that we as a nation have always struggled and that these forces are not new. But that is not all we need to have. We also need to have some moral articulation and dissent because our deepest faith and our deepest constitutional tradition have been hijacked to serve greed and racism and lies. We must raise our voices like the prophets and cry aloud and spare not. Silence is not an option. We cannot certify elections where the loser has three million more votes than the winner. We cannot certify when we see senators, I don't care if they're Democrat or, 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 or Republican or Congress people or people in state houses blocking people from universal health care that ought to be a right. We cannot allow any human 
human being to be denied equal protection under the law because of their race, their creed, their color, or their sexuality. We must have moral dissent and moral articulation that says some things are simply non-negotiable. We will never say a supermajority of any party has a right to run roughshod over the Constitution and the higher moral laws of faith and the universe. We must never allow hate to have the stage without lifting up the demands of love and truth and justice. No matter who's in power, we can never just be quiet. We must remember the moral dissenters like Henry David Thoreau, Martin King, Coretta King, Fannie Lou Hamer, Dorothy Day, Vincent DePaul. And then finally, we must have moral activism. The reason I laid out those five diseases because my, all of the next lectures are going to be a deeper dive into those diseases. We're going to talk about racism. We're going to talk about ecological devastation and health care at a deep level. We're going to talk about the war economy. We're going to trace the, over these four lectures what Christian and religious nationalism has done, is doing, and is trying to do, and how we need to challenge it. And we're going to deal with the war economy. Because not only must we have a moral analysis and moral articulation, we must have moral activism. We must not only dissent, but we must nonviolently disrupt what is destructive, not with hate, but with revolutionary love. We must love this nation enough that when it's wrong to take a knee and refuse to get up. We must love it enough to stand between the ICE agent who's been ordered to do wrong and the immigrant neighbor who wants to do right. We must love our democracy enough to go to jail for it in nonviolent civil disobedience, to sue in the courts for it and to register everybody you know to vote at the vote ballot box for it. We don't have to despair. We know what works because in every age people have come together. The abolitionists came together. Blacks and whites in the 1800s came together. Black, white, brown, young, old, gay, straight, civil rights, labor, Christian, Jew, and Muslim came together. And you know why you're alive today? You know why you're seeing all of what you're seeing now is because I believe the God of the universe is trusting you to come together one more time and refuse to allow what we're seeing to continue to happen without a moral cry. Yes, we were born for such a time as this. Yes, Vincent de Paul is dead now. John the Baptist is dead now. St. John is dead now. Harriet Tubman is dead now. William Lord Garrison, the white abolitionist, is dead now. Henry Thoreau is dead now. Martin Luther King is dead now. Fannie Lou Hamer is dead now. Viola Wusa, a white woman who stood with black people and were killed, was killed less than an hour after the, after the march from Selma to Montgomery, dead now. Mega Evers, dead now. Malcolm, dead now. The Catholic priest and the nuns that walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they are dead now. The Unitarians that march, they are dead now. But guess what? We are are their children. We are the sons and the daughters of those who raised the moral critique in the past, and we must raise it in the present. What's going on might be wrong in America, but we are the ones, and we must make the extremists ask that question. What's going wrong? I see them marching again. I see them standing again. I see black and white people and brown people and Latino and Asian and red and yellow people coming together and refusing refusing to give up on the heart and the soul of this democracy. I'm 55 years old. I was born two days after the March on Washington in 1963. A few years ago, lost the use of my legs. They said I'd never walk again, but by the grace of God, by a whole lot of prayer warriors, by my doctors, my physicians, and all of the ph pharmacists, they came together. I believe today there's only one reason to be alive and only one reason to have a portion of health and strength, and that is to stand up and fight for the soul and the health of this nation. Won't you join the cause? Won't you join the effort? Won't you understand this is not America's first time through a hard time, but we made it before. And if we stand and raise a moral critique, we will make it again and come out better on the other side.